Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this evening, uh, I know the dignitaries, for some reason of modesty, have stepped on the second row, but you know, uh, we are missing a whole row here. If anybody wants to move up, uh, there's a whole row up here, okay? Uh, it's good to have you all uh, on the first row. Good, good example. Um, yeah, particularly those who are looking at this in a slanted way may want to come here. Um, this is the beginning of uh, a lecture series, the first one in the fall semester. And uh, we're going to approach a subject that is in the, in the minds of a lot of us, every, in the minds of everyone. Ever since the uh, Greek Prime Minister visited the uh, site of the ongoing excavation of Amphipolis this summer, this country uh, has been living in a state of frenzy. Uh, the speed with which the media uh, has been operating and the power of the social media have changed the rules, apparently, at least in this case, of how excavation uh, uh, finds are reported. One only hopes that it has not changed the way uh, an ex a proper excavation is supposed to be carried out. Numerous, often irresponsible opinions have been voiced, as you may have read, uh, about the date of the monument. Uh, and the press has been having a field day with uh, the issue of who is buried there, if anyone is buried there. The, the whole story, <clears throat> to me, uh, says a lot about how we Greeks feel about such historical characters as, uh, as uh, uh, Alexander's uh, mother, Olympias, or his wife, Roxani, or his son, Alexander IV, or even his admiral, uh, Nearchos, who led his fleet to the expedition in Asia. So we seem to regard them as sort of something like old relatives who, who just passed away a few years back. Um, the story also tells about how this historical relationship of not historical relation, uh, the, the, the relationship of the Greeks to history can be manipulated by politics and by the media. Anyhow, Amphipolis and the tomb will provide a missing link in our cultural memory at a time when our shared identity is going through a very difficult territory. Today we have with us two um, scholars who are uniquely placed to discuss uh, Amphipolis. First of all, the importance of the site at the age of Alexander, and then th the importance of the find to the Greek identity. Uh, I will start with the, um, with, with the order with which they will appear. And I will start with John Caravas, who was uh, educated at the universities of Oxford and Durham, where he completed his doctoral thesis on the evolution of Roman fortifications and frontier defense systems on the lower Danube in the early Principate, that's the first and second century AD. Uh, his main areas of expertise and interest fall uh, within the late Hellenistic and early Roman uh, frontiers, or frontiers, the Roman period, with a particular interest in Roman frontiers and Roman provincial archaeology and ancient warfare. Following a two year teaching uh, fellowship, at the University of Durham, joined, uh, John joined CYA in 2003, boy the years go by very fast, where he has been teaching ever since uh, classes on Hellenistic and Roman history. 
He has also taught uh, as a visiting professor for Penn State University, Lake Forest College, and the University of Delaware. In 2008, he became the co-principal investigator at the site of Almiris, a major Greek, Roman, and Byzantine military and civilian site on the Danube, on the Danube Delta in Romania. Uh, while in 2010 he became director of, uh, of excavations at the, Lom at the late Roman site at Gratiana. In 2015 he will be acting as the co-director of excavations at the military and civilian site of Salsovia on the Danube. On the Danube. Um, and I come to a second speaker and that's uh, Professor Dimitris Planzos, whom we also had the uh, pleasure to have here as a member of our faculty for, for a couple of years in the past. Uh, Dimitris Planzos is a classical archaeologist educated in Athens at Oxford. He has published on Greek art, on the development of classical archaeology as a discipline in the 20th century, and on modern receptions of classical heritage. Modern receptions of classical heritage. This is very much what he will be talking about today, I think. His publications include Hellenistic Engraved Gems, a Greek language textbook entitled Greek Art and Archaeology, the edited volumes, uh, A Singular Antiquity, Archaeology and Hellenistic Identity in 20th Century Greece, and a companion to Greek art. This is his latest. He teaches classical archaeology at the Department of History and Archaeology of the University of Athens. He is the director of the Argos Orestikon excavation, which is in Castoria, in northern Greece, and he is a fellow of the Society of Antiqu Antiquaries in London. With nothing further, I want to ask John to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Phil, for the introduction, and thank you all so much for coming here. I must say that I'm very pleasantly surprised to see a full house, but then again, these days, the very mere mention of the name Amphipolis is bound to generate a lot of interest, let alone, of course, some heated discussions and debates. Uh, I'm going to tell you a few things about what my contribution or what I am doing here in this particular respect because, or before passing along the puck over to my dear friend and colleague Dimitris Blanzos. Uh, I am not here to offer yet another opinion as to what on earth the new finds at Casta Hill and Amphipolis are. Far from it. I am here to provide a historical narrative. I am here to provide, in fact, some major milestones with regard to the history of ancient Amphipolis, both for the benefit of our student bodies here at CYA, but most importantly to try and highlight the overall significance of Amphipolis this time as a site, from the time of its foundation of the 5th century all the way down to late antiquity. I find it actually a relatively sad site that, had it not been for the recent discovery of the major find, don't get me wrong, at the Casta Hill, many people would not have known what Amphipolis represents. In fact, Amphipolis would have been nothing more than a relatively unknown quantity. I hope that by the end of this brief presentation, this, in fact, will have altered at least with regard to your own minds. Uh, I'm going to start you off by what I think makes Amphipolis so important. In fact, it seems to be its location. Amphipolis, as you're about to see here in a close-up of the map, occupies a very commanding strategic position on the east bank of the Strimon River. And the interesting thing about this particular location is that it's in very close proximity to the very fertile alluvial plains that are afforded by the Strimon River itself, and equally in very close proximity to two very wealthy and prosperous regions. One is, in fact, the Pangaeon Mountain. It's actually outside of the map. You can imagine the Pangaeon Mountain is located just to the northeast of Amphipolis. The Pangaeon Mountain is renowned throughout antiquity for its silver and gold mines. And just to give an indication of the kind of wealth that these can generate, we do know that roughly by the 4th century before the Common Era, 
the gold and silver mines at Bangueo can pump out 1,000 talents per year. To put things into comparison, the overall revenue of Athens at the time, and I mean the overall of the city-state, would be roughly one-tenth of that. At the same time, and as noted at least on two occasions by one of the major sources that records things in the area, that is Thucydides, you would also find that the region around Amphipolis is one of the foremost timber or shipbuilding timber that you would be able to find. Something that will become imperative for all the major powers that one way or the other have tried to either occupy or to establish a stronghold in this particular area. As such, and considering the richness of the site and the location, it is really no surprise to find that the overall area, not so much Amphipolis, has been inhabited from at least the third millennium before the Common Era. Our reconstruction of the picture of habitation, at least pertaining to the Bronze Age, is a little bit more problematic than that. But excavations that were carried out at the site of Amphipolis, mostly by Professor Lazaridis, showed a great degree of material evidence, material richness, that tends to suggest that by the early archaic period, Amphipolis had become a very important site, most likely, or the most likely tenants being the Thracians, given the close geographical proximity, the Paeonians, just up north from the upper Stremont Valley, and, as John Boardman in fact said, perhaps some Illyrian tribes. The one thing that we do know, at least as verified by our literary sources, is that by the 6th century, when we start having a sustained habitation of the area, we have also the occupation by the Adonians, a tribe that seems to have been of Thracian stock. So this is the first time we can start recognizing an actual resident in this particular site. This area has now come, or becomes, commonly referred to as the Enea OV, the Nine Roads. Now this would obviously indicate the existence of a very active or intense hub that would facilitate not only trade and commerce, emanating anywhere eastwards from the Thracian hinterland and the seaboard into the rest of North Greece, but at the same time would also suggest that this is a very important route for lateral communications, being able to bring you from Amphipolis anywhere within the lower Balkan Peninsula. The earliest historical reference that we have with regard to the area comes right before the eve or the outbreak of the Persian Wars. In particular, this relates over to what would become the harbor of Amphipolis. This shows you where the later uh, colony of Amphipolis, as set up by the Athenians, was located. You are looking right here at the natural harbor by, indeed, the mouth of the Streamon River, in which we do have the Persians using as one of their main base of operations when they are trying to subjugate the overall area of Thrace and, indeed, of Peonia. This is also the first time that we have reference or echoes of attempts at colonization in the nearby or in the vicinity. The early excavator at the site, Lazaridis, claimed of evidence that exists that might denote the existence of Parians or Thassians. Thassos is an island in, in fact, the North Aegean, but Thassos himself seems to have been a colony of the Parians. Although I must say that with the exception of one particular funerary stele, there doesn't seem to be substantial evidence to in fact support this. We do, however, have two literary references. One comes from Herodotus that claims that Istios of Miletus, a very important, of course, Greek colony on Asia Minor, by the time of 512 tried to establish a colony in the near vicinity. This took the name of Mircinus, but this is located north of Amphipolis, so seems to have no bearing, at least as far as our main subject today is. Diodorus, in fact, maintains another story, or offers an alternative interpretation, claiming that it was no other than Aristagoras of Miletus who tried, in fact, to set up operations within the area of Amphipolis. Aristagoras is the one and only man very well known for being the instigator for the famous Ionian Revolt, the revolt of the Ionic Greek city-states in Asia Minor against their Persian control. Equally, an effort by the Athenians at occupying the site seems to be recorded by 497. But all of what these three have in common is that they ultimately failed. And that has to do with the fact that by 492, the Persians seem to have restored their occupation and therefore their domination throughout the area. 
By the time of the Persian Wars, we have some really interesting references about the area of the NLV, so in the vicinity of Amphipolis. It was obviously a logistic center for any Persian army that is now crossing the Hellespont and coming from Thrace into northern Greece, and that would have included the ill-fated expedition of Mardonius in 492, which was a complete disaster, but at the same time, the other one of Xerxes in the second phase of the Persian Wars in 480. Here, it is interesting that Herodotus mentions a very interesting fact. By the bridge that, in fact, would exist to cross over the streamon, apparently Xerxes is known to have sacrificed nine boys and nine girls. Something, however, that doesn't seem to actually correspond. This doesn't seem to be accurate in any particular respect. Most likely, it's one of those genuine moments of Herodotan fabrication. Another story that seems, in fact, to have a connection with uh, Aeneo at the time is what you see there at the very end. After the Persian Wars are done, after, in fact, the defeat of the Persians at the Battle of Pladea, the remnant of the Persian army is trying to find its way all the way back to Asia Minor. At this point, it is apparently the king of Macedonia, Alexander I, who is reportedly, or who had reportedly, ambushed the Persians and therefore been able to wipe out the remaining army. Again, this does not seem to be corroborated by other literary evidence. Not even Herodotus seems to include it. But nevertheless, it is a very interesting occurrence, as indeed it tends to happen. Once the Persian is over, this is the point in time where we can start discussing Athens' attempts, intense attempts, to try and take over this particular area. You do notice that under the guidance of Cimon, the Athenians are indeed capable of capturing Aeon, so therefore the harbor at the mouth of the river. But when it comes over to Aeneo, they, this seemed to prove to be a little bit more of a tough nut to crack, as despite repeated efforts that lasted for more than 10 years, it was the local Edonians who managed not only to repel the Athenians, but equally to slaughter 10,000 Athenian settlers and their own commander in charge, Sophonis, by 465. If at first you don't succeed, you just try again. And this seems to be a typical case, at least as far as Athenian policy is concerned. Long story short, it is indeed Agnon, the Athenian general, who by 437 manages to occupy the territory, and at this point in time is responsible for the establishment and the foundation of an Athenian colony, which henceforth we will refer to as Amphipolis. So therefore, Amphipolis proper. And you will see that the definition, or one of the possible definition as to what it means, essentially around the city. Here you'll be able to see the position of Amphipolis after its foundation by the Athenians of 437. You will notice, of course, the circuit or the fortification walls that seems to be around the city. Its location on a promontory overlooking the, west ba the east bank of the Stremon River. And equally, you will also notice the evidence, thanks to the archaeological excavation, of where the Acropolis is located. One thing that we must have in mind, if you ever find yourselves to the site of Acropolis and you happen to visit it, most of the early buildings that you would have found on the Acropolis were later superimposed, so therefore destroyed and superimposed by later Byzantine buildings. Something, though, showing you the continuity historically and otherwise you would encounter over at the site. Given its importance, you would find that Amphipolis is without doubt one of the most hotly contested and disputed issues when it comes over to the Peloponnesian War and obviously the two warring factors with Athens and Sparta. The city was in fact captured by the Spartans thanks to the exploits of their king Brasidas by 424, therefore beginning the period of Spartan hegemony over the region. Athenian attempts at recapturing it proved to be completely futile. In fact, the one evident or the one incident that I've recorded there in 422 would involve the Athenian general Cleon and in a rather famous battle as recorded by Thucydides, both commanders, Vasivas and Cleon, died in the process. Nevertheless, the Athenians did not manage, in fact, to recapture the town. Once the time for the negotiation for the Peace of Nikia, so therefore the armistice that was signed in 421 between Athens and Sparta came into being, Amphipolis became one of the main subject or the most hotly disputed issues. Intense negotiations followed. The Athenians would in fact refuse to even sign the peace treaty unless Amphipolis fell back under their sovereignty or their jurisdiction. 
The Spartans reluctantly appear to have given it back or restored it back to Athenian control. But we have a rather, incident, uh, a rather interesting incident in which the Afipolitans themselves do not want to be under direct Athenian control. The reason for this might have to do with the demographics. By this point in time, it is quite possible that within Amphipolis, the Athenians themselves, the original settlers, would only have been a minority. And with the infusion of other settlers, many from Ionia, but some even from Chalkis in Euboea, that means that they decided to, in fact, follow an entirely independent action. Technically speaking, the city from that point on, and once in fact by 421 the Spartans have evacuated, starts a very long and prosperous period of its own political independence, which as you're about to see, will last all the way up to 357 of the Common Era. This is the point in time where, as you will notice, with a very brief little hiccup in between, when Macedonian forces under Perdiccas III, he is one of the brothers of Philip II, the father of Alexander. But, in fact, with the exception of this very temporary occupation, the city would remain independent until its final capture by Philip II of Macedon in 357. This seems, in fact, or the capture of Amphipolis, seems to have borne very, very badly upon Athenian prestige at the time. In fact, one of the main issues that is highlighted by Demosthenes in his famous Philippics seems to talk about the loss of Amphipolis, and most importantly, about the double dealings of Philip, who apparently had once offered to give or trade back Amphipolis in return for Pithna. Something that, again, no other source seems to be able to corroborate. So by 357, we have the occupation of Amphipolis by the Macedonians. And Amphipolis, which you notice right there at the edge of the map, will now become the main springboard for Philip's expansionist drive. First, indeed, over to the area of Thrace, including the seaboard and the hinterland, and all the way up to carrying Macedonian arms up to Byzantium. So the importance of Amphipolis, at least as far as Macedonian expansion is concerned, can definitely not be underestimated. Speaking of Amphipolis, and this time about his son Alexander, no surprise to find that the natural harbor at Aeon, right in front of Amphipolis, served as the main base or the rallying point for Alexander's naval forces right before setting off for his Persian expedition. Alexander's fleet would only consist of 160 ships. And because of its very low numbers and the immense cost to his pocket, to his treasury, in order to be able to support it, the role actually of the fleet was nothing more to provide logistical supply, while at the same time Alexander's land forces seemed to in fact go within the hinterland of Asia Minor before heading down eventually for the conquest of Egypt. Either ways, the fleet seems to have been completely dismissed by 331 as it no longer served any particular purpose. However, Amphipolis seems to have been either the place of origin or even residence of three of Alexander's best-known admirals. One, Nearchus, the second, indeed, Laomedon, and the third, Androsthenes of Lesbos. So, for instance, this particular, if you will, importance, at least as far as the fleet of Alexander is concerned, again, cannot be underestimated. It is within the Hellenistic period that, at least in my humble opinion, the Amphipolis, the city of Amphipolis, seems to go through a period of absolutely unprecedented prosperity and wealth. And this, perhaps, can be best reflected once we take a very brief look. I'm only going to show you a few slides available from the city itself. Right over here, you can see the massive fortification walls. Very, very great examples of early Hellenistic fortification walls. All the way down to the impressive defensive towers, circular in shape, which I could also double up as defensive bastions. So, therefore, always for the use of artillery itself. Right over here you see a view from the southeast, in fact, of the gymnasium and the palestra, which were excavated during the early phase of excavation by Professor Lazaridis. And in addition, of course, to the public buildings, you also get a very interesting reflection of the wealth of the prosperity that now starts pouring into Macedonia post-Alexandrine times, as reflected indeed by the interior decorations in the houses of Amphipolis at the time, and a really interesting reconstruction of an anaclidro for people who like living it large. Let's continue. 
The importance or the significance of Aphipolis definitely continues even after the Roman takeover by the middle of the second century before the Common Era. In fact, originally in 168, when the Romans managed to defeat the Macedonians after the Battle of Pydna and therefore occupy the territory, Amphipolis was placed as the capital of one of the four major administrative districts, as the Romans call it, the Meridus. So therefore highlighting its importance, later on with the creation of the province of Macedonia in 146, Thessaloniki obviously became the capital, but at the same time, Amphipolis is always recognized as a very important uh, city-state, or sorry, a, a very important city along. One of the reasons for this has to do, of course, with the existence or with the positioning of Amphipolis along one of the major routes or arteries of the Roman Empire at the time, built after the second century before the Common Era, known, of course, as the Via Ignatia a very, as I said, important communication route linking Dirachium over at the Illyrian coast all the way up to Byzantium. And therefore, Amphipolis being exactly, or given its location, would have served as a very important stop as it is. Later on, and during, of course, early, or rather late antiquity in the Byzantine period, once again, despite a relative demographic decline, Amphipolis seems to retain part of its former glory. As you'll notice, it became part of the province of Macedonia Prima. This is the one that focuses mostly on the lines of where the ancient kingdom of Macedonia was located. The capital, once again, is Thessaloniki. But you will notice that it also became the part of the Diocese of Macedonia and a bishopric, at least by the mid to fourth century, mid to fourth late century of the Common Era. The same thing can be seen once we start seeing the later Byzantine period, we start having only a demographic decline leading over to its final abandonment by the 9th century of the Common Era. So essentially, we have looked at more than almost 1,500 years of continuous occupation in which Amphipolis, without doubt, always remains a very significant part or a very significant settlement, not only within Macedonia, but in fact with regard to the rest of Greece. Thank you. It's great to be back here after a few years. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we heard a lot of interesting things from Yanis. Where is he? Ah, there. OK. A uh, lot of interesting things which are, of course, irrelevant to uh, the question, why is Amphipolis so important today? Uh, this is why Amphipolis should be important to us. but. Uh, uh, the frenzy, as described by Mr. Philoctopoulos about Amphipolis in the last two months or so, has nothing to do with, with history. Um, I'm going to talk about amphipolitics um, today. Uh, this, is, this is a term I coined myself. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a bit of a joke, actually. Um, uh, as I explain here, uh, amphipolitics is when you dig into the past as a way to deal with the present. Um, imagine a nation, let, let's say Greece, um, um, performing uh, uh, its, its own archaeology as a way of dealing with its, uh, its present and trying to uh, imagine a better future for uh, itself. It's a national uh, way of doing archaeology, a nationalist way of doing archaeology, if you like, and it's not very original, and it's not, it's not um, a Greek uh, privilege. Uh, many other nations do it. Uh, the Turks do it, the Italians do it, the Egyptians do it. Um, uh, people in Thailand, or in Japan, or in Mexico. Um, so it could have other names, but uh, um, today let's uh, talk about Amphipolis. Um, 
and try to see why it is that these finds, which are spectacular indeed, have captured uh, the public's imagination to such an extent. So what's the story with Amphipolis 2014? Um, there's a simple answer to why Amphipolis has uh, captured the imagination of the Greeks to, the certain, to, to this extent. Uh, it's a simple word, archaeology. Archaeology is, uh, is a historical discipline, uh, but it's different from history. Uh, all the facts that um, Yanis gave us are just stories, things we hear about, but you cannot actually touch. Um, philology uh, works with text, but again, you cannot touch what philology is all about. Archaeology tends to deal with, with um, objects. As we say uh, in our students, um, uh, uh, archaeology allows us to appreciate the tactility of the past, uh, the ability of the past to, be, to become an artifact which we can use. Um, so, archaeology tends to look positivistic, works with positive uh, ideas, with, uh, with, uh, with facts, with figures. Um, it tends to look scientific. Even in, in, in those uh, pictures from, from Amphipolis, you see people working um, with, with uh, scaffolding and, and tools and equipment. Uh, they, they don't just think, they, they do things. Um, so archaeology collects the material remains of the past, of a past culture, in order to reuse them, and we reuse them as uh, objets d'art in our museums as, uh, or in our collections, uh, we exhibit them, uh, we call them masterpieces, or we admire them as curiosities from a past culture which we do not quite understand. And this we do in order to make sense of both past and present. This is a picture um, almost uh, a century old from the museum in Corinth. Um, you see uh, classical artifacts, st statuary, uh, pottery, uh, bits and pieces here, um, displayed in order with no much of, uh, fuss about them, no many, not many texts or wall texts and panels explaining what you see, simply because people in those days believed that um, archaeological artifacts speak for themselves. They tell you the story themselves. You look at them, and simply by looking at them, you understand what the past is all about. Um, archaeology far more than that, is the way modern nations represent themselves to themselves and others. And this is a photograph from the Benaki Museum, a museum which you may have visited already or you're going to um, during your, your stay in Athens. Um, and here you can see um, a piece of Greek sculpture uh, shown in the same room with a Christian icon. Why is this? simply because the Greeks like to represent their nation as uh, a historical nation with a continuous history going back to times immemorial, going back to the uh, prehistory and even before that, even before uh, the Greeks themselves appeared on the country we, we today call Greece. So, uh, simply by displaying medieval artifacts with classical artifacts, with prehistorical uh, artifacts in the same room, we try to suggest that we, in fact, cover, as a nation, this whole trajectory. And finally, archaeology is a method of national soul-searching, but also a way of uh, self-promotion. And this is, again, a picture from the uh, Benaki Museum showing national costumes, traditional costumes from the 19th century, showing um, how sophisticated um, uh, the, the, the Greek bourgeoisie may have looked in, in those early days for the Greek uh, state. So, um, before going to Amphipolis itself, let's talk about a couple of what I would like to call Amphipolitics moments, uh, which have nothing to do with Amphipolis per se. Amphipolitics moment number one, the nation as uh, archaeologist 
of its own past. Um, the man you see here is the current Prime Minister of Greece, Andronis Samaras. At the time, however, he was the Minister for Culture. And the, uh, the day is in June 2009, uh, I think the 21st of June or something like that, and this is the opening of the new Acropolis Museum. And what he's doing here is he's using these nice white uh, gloves that the restorers use to handle antiquities in order to place this final bit from the Parthenon frieze uh, on its place uh, at the museum installation. Uh, significantly, these pieces are in white plaster because they are back in London as the Elgin marbles, but this is not an Elgin marble. This is a Greek marble. This is a Parthenon marble. Uh, it belongs to us. It's here in, in Athens. And, in, and this is what um, Minister of, of Culture Samaras decided to um, display himself um, as a way to uh, uh, suggest that um, the Greek nation is the sole inheritor of classical culture and a very efficient owner and conservator of that culture. Um, Anthropolitics moment number two, uh, just recently, June 2014. Um, this is not in Greece. This is the British Museum in London. Uh, the lady here is a, a Greek opera singer called Sonia Theodoridou, and three um, uh, models or dance ballet dancers, um, uh, and there were three, there were three more. She, she, she came there with, with six uh, women dressed in white um, in order to uh, look at the carotid in this uh, kind of soulful way, um, in order to suggest that um, the Greeks are missing uh, the carotid which is still in London, whereas the other five are here in the Acropolis Museum. Now, of course, I never understood why she went with six um, characters, even, even though um, uh, they were missing one. So, but technically, they ought to have been five looking for the sixth. Anyway, <laughs> anyway um, this, this uh, performance um, was never noted by anyone other than us here in Greece. I don't think there was any report of it in the press. Um, in international press, I mean. Uh, no blogs were interested in it. Uh, nothing was ever heard about it, even though she was, she, they were walking uh, in the British Museum in, in, in the streets of London for, for quite some time last June doing this thing. Um, um, but, okay, uh, this was just for us as a reminder that we believe that Greek, cl the classical culture runs through our veins, that we are, in fact, the embodiment of these beautiful statues back uh, from the classical period. Of course, uh, there's no uh, more characteristic amphipolitics moment than Amphipolis itself. Um, since last uh, July, a, a massive excavation site has emerged, uh, a site we knew, we knew since 1964, but uh, as things go, uh, it, this was the time that uh, we could excavate it and the um, archaeologists of the, region de 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 of the region decided that it was a good time to excavate it. Um, and it made a, a great impact simply because for the first, for the first thing, uh, it showed that uh, you can actually have new discoveries in Greece in the 21st century. Uh, and this is something that it's, it's, it's nice to know. It's something that it's nice to be able to tell people out there that uh, Greece is still a country where archaeological discoveries can happen. Um, so that was one of the reasons why Amphipolis made such a, uh, an impact. Uh, this is again um, Andoni Samaras now as uh, Prime Minister of Greece. He went, he visited, and actually he dated the tomb himself. He was, he was the person, he was the first person who came out and offered a date for the tomb. He said, we're excavating here a tomb of the late 4th century BC. And uh, perhaps he identified the, the builder with Dinocrates, who was the personal architect to Alexander the Great. 
So, why was he interested? Perhaps he likes archaeology, I don't know. Uh, many people like archaeology, I like archaeology, but um, I think that in his mind ran this idea that we have to show uh, out there that uh, we, as modern Greeks, are able to manage uh, classical heritage, that we are worthy of that heritage, and we can uh, manage it uh, appropriately. Um, and we can do this as politicians, we can do this as state academics, we can do this as state archaeologists. So here we are doing what we're good at, and we're better at it than anybody else out there. Um, and to be honest, this is a great discovery that can change Greece's rather bleak predicament at the moment and work as a way into the future. Uh, you all know, you're, you're here how, for uh, how long so far? The, a month or so? So I'm, I'm sure you, re you have realized the logistics of the Greek crisis. Um, and uh, this uh, sudden discovery came as a gift, a, a gift from heaven, um, to those Greeks who feel that um, they don't deserve uh, this, this current predicament. Because, to be honest, uh, classical Greece has become a part of our identity to such an extent that we cannot actually escape from it even if we wanted to. Um, this is uh, a drawing discussing the Greek economy, the collapse of the Greek economy uh, back in 2010, and the risks it posed, this collapse, for the entire European Monetary Union. But why show Greek economy as a Parthenon-like, quasi-Parthenonian uh, temple? Uh, yes, it's Ionic, but still, I think it's the, Parthenon, <laughs> it's the Parthenon they have in mind. Simply because they know what we're doing with classical culture. Uh, they have realized that we're using it to advance our chances to the international arena. So uh, I think they answer back um, with their own, um, um, in their own way. So Greece is like a classical temple collapse, collapsing uh, in, in a state of horrible disrepair which is a, a, a bit like accusing the Greeks that cannot even uh, take care of the, the classical monuments, let, let alone uh, their economy. And of course, this is not the only um, occasion this, this thing happened. Acropolis Adieu, it's an, it's an old uh, song sung by Mireille Mathieu and now used by Der Spiegel in order to suggest that Acropolis, that is Athens, that is Greece, has to uh, say goodbye to the European Union because the Greeks are simply not fit to be members of the European Union. And of course, Acropolis now, a reference to the old uh, Francis Ford Coppola movie, Apocalypse Now, where again, the, the, now this is, this is a movie you may recall about the disaster, the American disaster in Vietnam. And here you, ha you have the famous helicopters from that movie, but uh, flying over the Parthenon. Again, the Parthenon is used as a symbol of Athens. Athens is used as a symbol of Greece. And Frau Merkel here um, um, in a rather uh, menacing way. Uh, so uh, again, uh, Gre the Greeks, modern Greeks, are criticized um, because of the way they're handling uh, their economy, but also uh, they're criticized of, of the way uh, they're handling their classical heritage. Um, and again, uh, um, uh, uh, uh Greece as a discobolus, as a classical statue, threatening, threatening everyone else in the European Monetary Union. But this is not the end of the story. There are other, other cases, there are other incidents where 
Um, the Greeks, again, as ancient Greeks, well, people have realized that we like to dress up as ancient Greeks, to pretend that we are them, that we are uh, the sons of Pericles and Alexander the Great, so there it goes. Uh, here, of course, they're presented as beggars and as cheats. You see here uh, um, the Greeks in the European Union trying to either steal or to bribe their way into uh, the European Monetary Union. And here, of course, as, as beggars, uh, again, uh, with the Parthenon looming in the background. So um, the frenzy with Amphipolis comes uh, as a welcome uh, answer to this in the um, collective imaginary of, uh, of, of, uh, of modern Greeks. Uh, modern Greeks, since the discovery of the uh, Amphipolis tomb, um, might think, or certainly think, that this could be a very good answer to this kind of uh, unfair and harsh uh, jokes. But there's something wrong with this picture. And um, as uh, cultural historians, we have learned that uh, it is okay if people fantasize about uh, different versions of the past. Um, that it is okay if uh, people dress up as Alexander the Great or Pericles or whatever. Uh, it is okay if people uh, believe that Alexander himself actually lies at the end of that uh, corridor. Um, some people might believe that even that uh, Alexander the Great is alive uh, in there, waiting for us. That's how we excavate in such a haste to find him. Uh, uh, we're still time. <laughs> however, however, there are some things that are wrong with this kind of uh, dealing with the past. Um, first of all, the way the excavation itself is carried out, it is a bit hasty. Um, and um, so, so, some of us who are working in the, in the area uh, know that um, d the dating of the find and the identification of the occupant started long before the excavation itself. So some of the members of the team have been officially talking uh, about um, this or that as a uh, potential owner of the, of the tomb. Um, and this name dropping started with Roxany and uh, Alexander IV, and then it went on with uh, Nearchos and perhaps somebody else, uh, and also Dinocrates as the, the uh, potential uh, architect uh, of, of the tomb um, came up as, uh, as a, a definite uh, answer, not, not just uh, a question mark. So I would say that one thing that is wrong with the Amphipolis uh, case uh, is the way uh, the excavation itself is carried out to a certain extent, that the um, academic protocol is not uh, truly uh, followed here. Uh, the other thing that I find rather irritating with Amphipolis is that um, perhaps it allows us to show too much of our nationalist pride. Um, okay, and this is, this is the, uh, the, the head excavator, uh, Mrs. Peristeri. Uh, this is the Secretary General of the Ministry of, uh, of Culture. Uh, this is the Prime Minister at the back, and this is uh, the Prime Minister's wife. Uh, what they're looking at is, I, I don't know, um, it's a piece of stone. Uh, something really important, perhaps, but um, um, not really, I, I don't think. Anyway, um, <laughs> why is it that a contemporary Greek like me, like Yanis, like Mr. Philoctopoulos, should be really proud about what is going on here? Yes, we're interested. Yes, we are really curious to know what's going on in there. Uh, but why should we really be proud about a find uh, that has nothing to do with something that we, as a culture, produced? Um, now, of course, cultural identities are, are a good thing. Cultural identities are useful. This is a, a very nice picture. I love this picture. 
This is from a parade. Uh, this is a 4th of July parade in New York um, in the beginning of the 20th century. And this is, uh, these are members of the Greek community parading in New York um, uh, on the 4th of July. And they parade as Americans, uh, bringing with them their Greek heritage. And this is marvelous. This is exactly what made um, the United States what they are. Uh, and you can see the boy here in his national costume, and you can see an Athena and a Zeus behind, and some other ancients and some less ancients and some more moderns, and it goes on. Okay, this is fine. I can live with that. But uh, there is the risk that you can go from here uh, to the point of believing that this is exceptional, that this is unique, that only we have this and no one else. Um, and finally, there is the question of this toe. I don't know if you, if you heard about it or read about it. The moment, this is, this is the foot of, of one of the carotids uh, from the tomb. Uh, there are two of them, very nice, uh, made of marble. Uh, they support the roof, the beam rather, just uh, in front of one of the gates leading into the tomb, or into what we assume to be a tomb that far. And I noticed that the moment they were revealed, uh, a lot of pictures of their feet came out uh, into the internet and the press. Um, there is this um, uh, story, there is this uh, belief that uh, you know, most people on this earth have uh, their uh, first toe longer than the second one. 10% uh, uh, 10, 10 overall of the world population have it the other way around. Uh, this is a very well-known deformity called the Morton's toe. <laughs> Basically, what happens here is that the, uh, the, the second metatarsal bone, this one, of your first toe, of your big toe, is shorter than it ought to be which makes your, f your first toe shorter than the second. So basically, um, it's, it's a problem, it's a disorder. Uh, I have it, Yanis has it, I don't know. <laughs> Mr. Philoctopoulos, who knows? But 10% 10, 10 of the entire population have it, um, and uh, we cannot actually argue that 10% of the world population is Greek. Um, now, this disorder happens to be very common in our parts of the world. The Greeks had it, and more to the point, the Romans liked the fact that the Greeks had it. <laughs> Therefore, most Roman statues have it as well. So, showing this foot as a proof that this lady here is Greek, um, is a bit of a mistake because she could be Roman, but also it means to suggest that there is a racial link between her and us here today. And that all of you whose feet are normal are excluded from this community <laughs> between modern Greece and classical Greece. And this is a bit of a problem when we're talking about uh, classical culture. So, archaeology can still be fascinating in the age of globalization and even more so and could be useful in this age because it helps people construct their own uh, or their collective cultural identities. And this is why Amphipolis um, came to help and this is why Amphipolitics is an issue here in Greece today. Um, like many other modern nation states in the periphery of the West, Greece is in need of a viable cultural identity that may be recognizable by others, for better or for worse, because, of course, we, we, we're classical, but we're classical when people admire us, we're classical when people um, castigate us for not doing our logistics right. 
Um, and archaeological identities, like the ones we're trying to construct here with Amphipolis, with Amphipolitics, um, can be nationalist, can be exceptionalist, can be racist, but are they truly efficient? What are we doing with them? What is the point of a nationalist uh, archaeology today? Um, what is the point of an archaeology that excludes uh, most parts of the world population? Um, now, Classical culture, and Amphipolis is part of classical culture, and this new find, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it will be breathtaking and not disappointing. Um, classical culture is not the property of a sole nation. It's not the property of the Greeks. It's not the property of the Turks. It's not the property of the Cypriots or the, the Italians, for that matter, or the Spaniards. Um, it, it cannot be seen to be the property of the people, us, modern Greeks, who happen to occupy the soil where um, classical culture uh, flourished um, so many centuries ago, um, where this classical monument, the Amphipolis tomb, stands now. Um, we have to believe, to accept, that whatever, is, whatever lies behind those characters over there is uh, part of, a, of world's heritage at large. And even though I'm finishing with a question mark down there, I think you all get the point of what I wanted to, to say. Thank you. Υπάρχουν εκεί από εκεί, στο πλάι, στο πλάι, στο πλάι. Excuse me, but I, I think I'm entitled to speak, to say that by chance, last week I published an article in the front page of a Greek newspaper. My name is Maratos Tilemachos. And the title of this article was Amphipolitics. Oh. This is by chance. The second, I published one too. <laughs> the, second, the second word was amphipolisimia. Ah. So the gist of this article was what made me uh, irritated by the horror um, evinced by, by lots of people, lest it so happened that there may be a Roman. And as you all know, we had very close by the tremendous Battle of Philippi of at least 200, well, at least, anyway, approximately 200,000 Romans fighting, and, and a lot of them slaughtered and, and buried there. Now, I used a very sarcastic tone in this article. I said, why are you so horrified lest this, this uh, monument is Roman, what is the difference? When we have in front of us here, just a few steps away, the temple of the remains of the temple of Olympius, the uh, there's nothing that is more Greek than that. It was built by a Roman, Hadrian. And then they say, ah, we shall see the, the epigraphes, the, the inscriptions. inscriptions. But the inscriptions on, on that temple are Roman names in Greek. So uh, it's really uh, futile to, to try to, to distinguish Rome from, from Greece at the time, at the time of Hadrian, at any rate. And your, your lecture was, was the other one, extremely informative, and, and I, as an, part of the audience, thank you for it, because we, we learned a lot of things. Uh, but a lot of your lecture was in the realm of psychoanalysis, and the needs of identity, which are not in the realm of archaeology. 
and to us are, are quite obvious uh, to, to a Greek today um, that the sister of Alexander the Great is a mermaid that agitates the sea and asks whether he is alive or not, etc. Every, every Greek knows this. Every nation has need of myths and perhaps we more than others. I, I, I will stop here because I've spoken to Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both for your talks. Uh, I, I, I love them both. Uh, and I have one question for Yanis' talk and one, uh, two questions uh, very quickly uh, um, um, for the second speaker. So, so Yanis, was there an argument in your presentation, despite what you said about and like not arguing, and was the argument um, something like uh, leading to the thought that the side, the city, and the area of Amphipolis has been important and had been important for a very long time, and that makes us think, or that should be making us think, that we cannot decide on the, on the origin or like the dating of the site from like a couple of pictures uh, on, on a web page, or from like the very early parts of the excavation. So this is a question for you, Yanis. And, and, and like two questions, maybe I'll ask just one question. Uh, uh, all right, by the British and the German, right? Yeah. Um, by people or peoples or countries or states uh, by whom Greece has been or has found itself, uh, um, uh, let's say, um, under, uh, uh, as under semi-colonization, should yes. I put it that way? I don't know if it's a technical term. Uh, Amy, correct me. Uh, all right. um, could the current attitude, of, especially of the, current, of, of the Greek state, be a sort of um, the answer or the attitude yes. of a subject that has been until very recently, probably mm -hmm. also even now, semi-colonized. Mm -hmm. So could this be mm -hmm. the answer of the colonized subject? Thank you. Um, okay, coming to my question. Uh, first of all, a distinction should be made a distinction between the site itself, and that's exactly the kind of historical narrative that I tried to provide, the city-state or the city of Amphipolis, as opposed to the recent find at the Casta Hill overlooking Amphipolis. With regard to the tomb itself, I have the ostrich approach. This is not something that right now I think would be extremely premature to not only try and provide any definitive answers as to the purpose and function of that individual building, let alone should it be a tomb as to who is in there or who is not in there. And as Dimitris rightly noted, a lot of names have been thrown out there and most of the evidence that I tend to see in conjunction is um, conjectural, it's speculative, uh, it is, as I said, premature at best. So the line that I tried to do, and remember that this was mostly for the benefit of our students, uh, was trying to ascertain the importance, the chronological importance, and the linear continuity of Amphipolis at a site. As I said in the introduction, I find it a very worrying fact that even today, people seem to know everything about the Casta Hill. People, in fact, or Greece seems to have nine million archaeologists as we speak, all of them professing ideas about what this tomb is. And for the love of God, some of the theories out there are just preposterous at best. One of my favorite ones, in fact, was lately, and I kid you not, Bucephalus, the horse of Alexander. <laughs> now that we're done with the family, now that we're done with the friends, now that we're done with the admirals, what the hell, just throw the horse inside. So while you have many people who are professing expertise as to what or to whom that thing belongs, at the same time, they're still hard pressed or do not know that much about what Amphipolis is. So we think, but I mean, you know, the tomb, Casta Hill, is just like a very small fraction of the great archaeological discoveries. It's equally just a very small fraction outside the city itself, which doesn't in any way, or if you will, is just um, corollary to the 
greatness of the city as it is. So finding a structure like that in the context of Amphipolis is, I think, very reflective. But otherwise, it's something that I do not want to get involved in for any number of reasons. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. I have this, yeah. Yes, I, th I think yeah, I agree with Yanis that we cannot uh, really say anything about, about this, this fine. We cannot uh, start name dropping or date it even. And I, I feel that the, the dating the, of the tomb has, has been proposed. It comes from a, a, from a sort of circular argument. They started with Roxani and then because Roxani is later fourth century, they stuck with her and now they cannot really uh, do anything about it. Um, about your question though, to me, um, yes, uh, classical archaeology has been long described as, as a form of colonization, uh, both of the, of, the, of the past as such and of the, the people uh, living in the classical land. So uh, uh, the Greeks, the Turks, the uh, Italians have been colonized. The Egyptians uh, have been um, colonized um, through uh, the appreciation to what they perceived as their past. Uh, Michael Hedgefeld, who is very well known here, comes every now and then and lectures here, uh, has presented his, his theory on crypto-colonialism. Crypto-colonialism is the idea that you uh, accept as your own self-image, your own self-portrayal, uh, imageries that have been used by others in order to describe you. So it's a, a sort of... Um, uh, the, uh, when you accept a representation created for you by others. Um, and Greece suffers from that, suffers a lot from that. And all, uh, all this uh, Amphipolis frenzy has to do with, with the uh, discomfort modern Greeks feel against the, the supremacy of the West, which is um, political, it is uh, uh, f uh, economical, it is cultural, even though Greece was never uh, colonized as such. And this is where uh, Hedsworth's theory works. He, he talks about crypto-colonialism in exactly the cases where uh, the country itself was not a colony. So it's not about Egypt or, or Cyprus. It's about uh, places like uh, Greece or Thailand, which were never colonized. Um, I think Chikula has a question. I'm a professional archaeologist, a member of the archaeological service. I was for 36 years. So, as many people in this um, hall know, uh, there is an archae archaeological law, and this archaeological law states that there are two kinds of excavations in Greece, or rather three, but in general two. There are rescue and test excavations, and there are systematic projects. The rescue and test excavations are conducted prior to other private constructions, ecopeda, okay, of uh, private uh, buildings, or um, uh, roads or other um, uh, public um, works. works. Okay. And then there are systematic projects that um, uh, members of the service uh, conduct. I, I have my systematic uh, projects uh, conducted uh, 30 years now, this year, it's 30 years. I work in Crete. Now, and I need to point out very strongly, this is the first time that a member of the archaeological service, a colleague of us, a colleague of us, says and introduces a third type of archaeological excavation conducted by a member of the archaeological service, and this is an, uh, an excavation of national interest, it's called. Yes, I, I, I think I answered that. I, need, I, I would like to invite uh, younger archaeologists to think about that. And this excavation, it's not a systematic project because it has not a permit from the Central Archaeological um, Council, the CAS. It's not a rescue excavation. And it is uh, funded by the ministry. Unlike our systematic projects, unlike uh, test excavations. And it is of national interest. Um, I, I mentioned it uh, earlier that 
I, I believe that perhaps they're doing this because they really believe that Alexander is still alive in the tomb, so they have, they have to get to him soon. And there, was, there were many hands there. I have a question. Um, my question for Dimitri is how has the Greek left and the Greek right in their own ways through what they emphasize, neglect, or distort create their own narrative about classical Greece? So the left and the right. This is, this is an extremely interesting um, question and this, this might take us to a whole uh, new lecture series. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Philoctopoulos. Um, there is... Um, uh, I, I can, I can um, start by saying this. Uh, the Greek left has uh, dealt with classical antiquity in a surprisingly... Uh, uh, in a surprising way, uh, in a way that is surprisingly uh, similar to the way the Greek right has used classical antiquity. So um, uh, you cannot, in, the, in the, the history of the Greek left in the 20th century, you will not find um, great differences. You'll find some scholars uh, arguing against slavery, for example, in Athens, or things like that, or against uh, the slaughtery of uh, Alexander and all that. But um, in, in those days, today, uh, I think the, the left takes a very similar position to the rest of, uh, of the nation uh, with, uh, it, with regard to uh, archaeology, classical culture, and archaeological excavations. There is an exception to that, and that is the far right, uh, the neo-Nazis here in, in Greece, who are dealing with the past in a completely, in a way of their own, uh, which takes them back, to, of course, to the history of Nazism itself. Um, but um, if, you, if, you, uh, if you were following uh, the Amphipolis uh, case uh, this summer, you would... You would uh, uh, see that uh, uh, members of the of the of the Syriza party visited uh, the Amphipolis excavation as well, and were interested and asked uh, what it's all about. And I'm not sure uh, that things would be different if um, we we were we had a, a left wing government right now in Greece. There might be some differences, but. Perhaps we would be surprised by the, the similarity of, of um, approaches. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yes. There, was, there was a. No? Okay. Uh, okay, I, oh. I'd, I'd like to thank you both for fascinating presentations, very informative. Uh, I have two very quick questions, though, for uh, Dr. Planzos, please. I was struck when um, you showed the slide of, with the Prime Minister's wife looking yes. at the little stone. Uh, I interpret it much more as a political a statement, obviously trying to gain points for the party and the government. But other than that, I was struck by your comment that why should the Greeks today be proud of something that happened so long ago that we have nothing to do with technically? It's not our achievement. And I just want to instinctively to ask you, isn't it, a, um, don't you think that it's a very primal and natural thing to be proud of one's cultural background, and I think this is common in any country across the world. The Russians are proud of yeah, their yes, music yeah. and art heritage, the French are, so it doesn't really matter that it's not something that we personally had nothing yeah. to do with, right? So you agree that, uh, and just very quickly, yeah. my second uh, question, um, do you think, as I personally believe, that this hysteria and this frenzy that's going on over this tomb now is directly linked to our current problem with our northern neighbors, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. Yes. We're in a struggle over proving mm -hmm. our, the Greek heritage of the region of Macedonia. So it's so important for us that it's Greek and not Roman as it could be as well, etc. Do you agree that we're in a, a, a battle now, quote yes. unquote, yeah. to prove the Greek nature of Macedonia, the whole area yeah. of Macedonia and its 
Thank you. I, I think, I think your, your second question answers the first, because I, I started by saying that this, the Amphipolis is not uh, peculiar to, to Greece. It would happen everywhere. Archaeology is loved, and national pride, of course, is, um, is inherent to, to the modernity itself. Uh, we cannot think ourselves outside the national, the national state, and this is not something that is bad. My problem with this, though, is that when it comes to the issue with, um, with, uh, with firearm, and this is something I didn't want to, to start here because I didn't have endless time to explain to everybody here what is the problem with, uh, with our uh, northern neighbors. Um, the problem is that when you start trying to resolve this with, um, uh, with excavation, then you're uh, making it worse. Uh, the problems Greek, Greece has with uh, its neighbors cannot be resolved through archaeology. Uh, the occupant of, of, of the Casta tomb uh, has, has nothing to do with uh, the dispute, the border dispute between um, Greece and Phyrom, Greece and Albania, Greece and Turkey. Uh, this is why I uh, believe that um, uh, encouraging Greek nationalism does not help us today. Because what we have here, what we have with the Macedonia problem, is two nationalisms at war. Uh, and the Macedonian nationalism, I mean the Phyrom nationalism, the Skopje nationalism, is a, a, a copy uh, of uh, Greek nationalism uh, 200 years ago. So we cannot really resolve this by copying the Macedonians who copy us. Um, if there is a problem with, with Phyrum, it can be resolved through diplomacy, th within the uh, uh, European framework, um, not through uh, 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 excavation or through the, the statues they erect in, in Skopje or we want to erect in, in Athens. This is why I find um, the, the handling of, of Amphipolis irritating for me as an archaeologist and as a Greek. I don't mind people uh, enjoying excavation. I, I, I like the idea. I'm, I'm curious about, about the outcome. I really want to know what's, what's going on in there. Um, uh, but I don't expect it to, um, to, to change my life or the life of anyone else uh, in, this, in this country. And this, this is where I think the problem has gone a bit, a bit, a bit wrong. Uh, yes? Um, first of all, congratulations to both of you. I have no idea about archaeology. I sort of shudder at the criticism about why these people are going faster than what they should be, because that doesn't but has there been any comparison to this media explosion, to the various media explosions that were happening with the Egyptian uh, excavations in the 20s and 30s? I, I don't think, I, I haven't read anything uh, relating Amphipolis to, to that, but to be honest, yes. Uh, in the back of everybody's mind, Tutankhamun is, is there, as was with, with, with Regina. You know, most of you in this room would know that in the late 70s, this massive discovery, this great uh, unlooted tomb, uh, was discovered by Manolis Andronikos. And that was a, a first time uh, when, in, in the 20th century thing, when um, Greeks realized that. Um, uh, archaeological discoveries can still happen. And that, that was a, a massive find, and that uh, uh, took everyone by surprise, including the, the excavator who believed that until the very last moment that the tomb was looted. Um, so, um, yes, uh, I'm, I'm sure people think that it's, it's, it's time to prove that, yes, we, we have um, important antiquities here as well. And, uh, uh, but, of course, times in the 20s and the 30s of the, uh, the 20th century were completely different. Excavations were handled differently then, had nothing to do with what 
Professor Tsipropoulou just described. So, I, you know, I don't think it's a good idea to imitate um, uh, Carter and, uh, and, his, and his people. Okay. Uh, They can, they can come late, they can email us. Έχουμε εδώ δύο. Thank you. Thank you both for uh, the presentation. So it's for uh, Dimitri. Uh, there is a very interesting parallel, in fact, and I think it's uh, Israel in the late 50s and the beginning of 60s, uh, when the site of uh, Masada uh, was discovered, and uh, at that point we see an amazing situation which is the performative dating of the politicians. When the vice uh, prime minister of Israel, uh, I forgot his name unfortunately, doesn't matter, sorry, uh, he, he visited Masada, he said this is the very site of Masada, this is the place where our ancestors committed suicide. And then this became the landmark of what became later uh, the state and the army of uh, Israel and uh, the Tzahal and all, yeah. all this situation. But this is what we have, as you know, I, sp I spent many years trying to, uh, to show the performative character of the Seleucid mm -hmm. uh, speeches and, uh, of the kings. This we have, here we have an amazing example of how the prime minister goes there and says this is the end of uh, last quarter of the fourth century. This in the mind of uh, normal Greeks, not academics, not archaeologists, becomes the trend. There is no alternative to this dating. I take a cab, this is fourth century, there is nothing else to say. Uh, you go to the supermarket, you say you're an archaeologist, there is no alternative. So we see an amazing example of what to avoid in the future, I think. Uh, an archaeologist, if you go to your Argos or Esticon and say this is of precise dating, it doesn't matter. Someone can challenge your dating and your idea. Who can challenge, and I'm not talking about academics, I'm not talking about other politicians, I'm, I'm talking about regular Greeks. Sorry, the term is not correct, but anyway. Uh, uh, I'm a regular Greek anyway. Uh, <laughs> I think, half Cypriot then. Uh, anyway, and in that case, you see that we decided what the monument is. All other options are not open. Yes, yes, yes. And this explains all the attacks to Olga Palagia and others who propose alternatives. Yes, and yes. just a point of uh, slight disagreement, we don't disagree very often, but I will disagree with you uh, on, on that point. You say that the problem with Firem or Scopio or whatever the name is should be uh, solved in different uh, in a different situation. That's obviously right, and you're obviously right on that. But this is the academic version. I think that the academic world, the last 20 years in Greece, completely ignored what happened in the lower stratas, and I don't say that in a pejorative way or a negative way, in the lower stratas of the Greek intelligentsia or whatever uh, those people were. They really, they had this ridiculous shows on TV that everybody laughed at during some period, but then it became a very trend situation. And the younger generations are really uh, poisoned with these ideas. And I, I really think that we, in the academic field we need to fight that yes. situation uh, and that ideology or whatever it is. It's, uh, it's true that we we missed we missed this development we missed it we missed, we missed it. We were completely absent. Yeah. I think it's it's your. Um, bringing it back to your rhetorical question, what's wrong with this picture? And my colleague, as I think, uh, pointed the way is um, seeing uh, Pretendere on um, on uh, Monday night. Yes. Um, watching the. Uh, news, uh, morning news programs, and then the mid-morning gossip programs, and then carrying on, on almost all, every station. Uh, and Yanni's mentioning everybody's, there's 9,000 archaeologists out there, but what seems to be here is what, five million? We can go farther. Ten. Um, the, what's, what's wrong with this picture is that all of these people have no, almost no understanding 
of what is archaeology and its purpose, and that I think probably history as well, uh, given the comments uh, of one historian uh, on Pratt and Derry, um, and that I think what's wrong with this picture is that Greece, if it's going to use its past, has to know what it, what it is and how it's obtained. And if you look at the, um, the Greek textbooks, history books, there's, it, there's nothing about archaeology. So what can be done here? What is the future of Greek archaeology if this kind of, this is of national interest, as my uh, wife pointed out, uh, it's a project of na national interest. What do you think is um, the future here for Greek archaeology from a Greek standpoint, a non a crypto uh, colonial standpoint. Yes. Well, we, this is what we're trying to do. Obviously, uh, us standing here in front, of, in front of you, we're not excluded from the public dialogue. We teach. Uh, I teach at a, a public Greek university. Uh, we write. Um, we, now we are aware of those problems, and this is why uh, the gentleman here has, has now left, but he said that, okay, what you're doing is psychology rather than archaeology. Uh, actually, what I'm doing is, uh, is um, cultural uh, uh, history. Um, and uh, my position at the University of Athens is one of cultural history. I'm doing reception studies. I'm not, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm an archaeologist, but also um, a cultural historian. And now that we have understood that these things cannot, cannot go one without the other, uh, I think we might have a chance at um, producing a, a, a generation of, uh, of people uh, uh, with, with a better understanding of archaeology. It's not very easy. Um, I, I didn't um, watch the Pretenderi show last uh, Monday, but I noticed, I noticed one thing, that the press the following day only reported on this professor's idea that is Festian in the tomb, and uh, Mrs. Peristeri's uh, insistence that it is a tomb of a very significant person of the late 4th century uh, BC. So this is the only, things, the, two, the only two things that the press thought worthy of reporting, and um, I'm sure the only things that interested the public at large. Oh, don't ask me, I worked in Romania by choice. <laughs> Where, of course, there's no nationalism. And Absolutely no. <laughs> not, no. Um, I, I think you began to address it, and then I didn't hear any more about it, but I've been very interested how Facebook mm. and other social media have been being used by academics to fight the battle of the date of the tomb to the point where I now hear people talking about did you like them or did you not like them because you're afraid someone will see your like and you'll get in trouble for that. And I mean, it's, it's a whole new game for academics yes. here on Facebook with the people well, putting out opinions and other people feeling like they have to comment on it. So what, what do you think is going on that's maybe productive or not productive in that realm? But for me, um, people is begun as a Facebook event because I was, I was on vacation and I was, I was, I was checking uh, the, the, uh, uh, the reports on my mobile um, on the beach. And uh, the first phone call from, from uh, national, Greek national TV came on August 16. I was at the beach and they said, would you like to comment? I said, comment on what? I, I can see even the pictures, you know, they were just the, the sphinxes at the time, was tiny. But yes, uh, Facebook and um, Twitter and, and all that um, is part of the discussion now, is, pa is part of, of the way we work and the part of the way we communicate. And it happens to me more and more often these days. I was involved with the, the other incident, the, the Kavafi on the bus. Remember that a few months ago when the Onassis Foundation published uh, uh, lines from Kavafi poem, poems on the buses and people took offense and you know, suddenly we're all tweeting and uh, Facebooking on, on this and now on Fipolis. Um, and uh, my students were sending me um, uh, Facebook messages 
uh, in the summer asking me about Amphipolis, they wouldn't call me. They would, they wouldn't, they would never think of uh, calling me on my mobile or even sending me an email. But with Facebook, it's easier. So it's something that I enjoy. Um, and for me, for me, uh, the internet and Facebook has become uh, my way of research. Basically, I do some cultural ethnography on the internet, as you perhaps know. Um, so, yes, I, I think we, can, we, we, we have to live with, with that. Okay. It looks like we have uh, exhausted the questions and the speakers. Uh, well, be, uh, first of all, I want to thank them for uh, a very informative and uh, interesting evening, both of you. You did a great job. Thank you so much. And uh, I want to invite you all to uh, go home and uh, check your toes and see whether, <laughs> whether you partake of Greek culture or not. If you find you do, let us know. Well, it's a special prize for you. There's uh, 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 drinks and refreshments out there for all of you. Thank you.